Welcome to episode seven of Beanie and Blazer Radio, your weekly audio dump of high performance insights and best practices to help you engineer a purposeful lifestyle. Hosted by me, Brandon Walker and Eric Horback. In today's episode, we're talking about how to learn. Yep, how to recognize opportunities to develop a new skill. We outline the four stages of learning and how to know when you're on the right track so you learn new stuff fast and with intention. This is a highly actionable episode, so buckle in. We're super excited for this one. All right, all right. React and Riff, the segment where you learn more than you expect about things that actually matter. This week was my turn to do the research. Eric, you ready to get fucked up with some knowledge? I thought you would never ask. Oh, thank God you're so excited. Uh, Today, we are talking about one of the most important skills that a person can carry. In business, in life, it is something that when I interview, when I hire for people, I look for their propensity for this. Today, we're talking about learning. Mm. How to learn, why Mm. it's so important, what the benefits are, uh, and... Before we dive into it, you and I both identify as lifelong learners, Mm -hmm. right? I think that's something that we talk about pretty regularly. And um, you know what's interesting about lifelong learners? I learned this doing the research for this episode. That concept of being a lifelong learner, I'm always familiar with it in the context of like tech and business and like book reading and stuff. That phrase was coined in the 1960s and it was an initiative to get senior citizens more involved in learning to increase their longevity and happiness after their like perceived value to society went away. No way. Yeah. So lifelong learner was initially like a senior education initiative. That's inter- that's cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. Total aside. Not yeah. not relevant here. Um, so. I mentioned that lifelong learners, uh, I, I would interview for the topic of learning. And one of the questions that I would ask in my interviews is, uh, what is the last book that you read? And mm. what was a key takeaway that you can teach me? Or what were, what were the key takeaways that you could teach me? And having that conversation with them, it, it gauges the person's level of curiosity, their retention, their ability to regurgitate the information. Um, Plus, I get to learn something new by asking that interview question. Uh, So anyway, today, talking about learning, um, specifically, what I would like to go through are how to learn better, right? Like I think it's a skill, knowing how to learn. How to learn better. Uh, Wanna talk about Um, how to structure your lifestyle around consuming information that will help you learn instead of what we are sort of predisposed to ingest based on social media, et cetera. And then finally, how you can accelerate your learning. So once you build some of the scaffolding and infrastructure, how you can, you know, maximize that and press forward. Mm. So before I dive into some of the technical nitty gritty stuff around learning, wanted to ask you about a skill that you recently learned um, and implemented in your life. And I would like to avoid zero to dangerous and being a dad because we've talked about those topics so much. So I want you to dig deep on Mm. a new skill that you've started implementing. And we're gonna use that as the example through the episode. Okay, interesting, let me think. Um, So first off, I love this. So I grew up with, and I think you were the same way, right? Like a bunch of people telling you that you had ADD, you have a learning disability, like you're going to be a slow learner and literally like putting you into this position of this mindset of like, you're a slow learner. You need to be in these little special classes. Like that's how I grew up. And that's what my early childhood world was. That's tough, dude. Yeah, totally. So like in that somehow I, in like a frustratingly like aggressive way was like, fuck this. I'm going to learn stuff in my own way. And I think that's what set me on like that path of being a continual learner. It was more to like to combat this like existential threat of being stupid Mm. versus because I had like some other like deeper meaning or something like that. But that's where it started for me anyway. What's nine times six smarty pants. We're not going to talk about that. (laughs) Um, no, I'm fine with numbers, but so the point is though that that answered the fucking question. The point <laughs> that's fifty four. 
<laughs> you nailed it. All right, sorry. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> Yeah. I'm turning red. I know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, to get back into it, it wasn't math that was the issue. It was reading. Yeah. And learning itself. Right? Math is like, I went, to, I went and got a finance degree, and that wasn't very hard. Mm. But like the whole idea of learning, my, I was so frustrated that no one actually taught you how to use your brain as a child. Like, here's how your brain works. Here's how you consume information and study information and then connect it to memories and stuff in your head. I never, never had that. So it was like one of those things I had to develop and I'm still developing it. Mm. So I can't, I wouldn't say that like I am by any means an expert in learning. And I think it does take me a really long time. And if it's something I'm not like super passionate about to learn something new, but if I'm passionate about it, like you can't get, you can't stop that focus right. from actually doing it. Right. So that being said, what's one thing that I've had to learn recently? I'm talking like the last year. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's something that comes to mind. It doesn't have to be an immediately pressing thing. Like I know you have had a lot on your plate with the new child and everything. But yeah. So the last year of my life, I, swear, I probably that's like the number one. Anything around that has been like the number one like learning experience that I've had and like really focused on. Um, prior to that. Uh, Okay. Uh, pitches. Mm. Uh, doing a, a pitch. Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> no, business pitches. Um, specifically startups. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, so one of the things I did was I took a Jim Quick class. Like yeah, an online like super gym. brain superpower guy. Brain superpower guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and in there, he walks you through this uh, step-by-step process of how to remember a speech. Um, I haven't used it in like a year. I haven't used any of the skills that like I learned in that thing, but it took me by myself in my office, staring at a a wall, like practicing this technique over and over again before actually getting it right. And what happened, like what was important about it was that like when you're pitching a business or you're pitching like a business idea in front of a ton of people, like that's like a, that's a social risk. Like that is a high risk environment. Mm-hmm. So you're naturally going to have a lot of anxiety. Right. And if you don't, like you're a freak of nature. Um, and without the tools that like someone like Jim quick teaches to like set your mind, right. Cause when you're like, when you're in that fight or flight mode, it's really hard to like remember mm-hmm. everything without those tools. Like you're standing by yourself in the dark and that's a really like rough place to be. Yeah. So, in my learning experience of doing that, I was able to, I, I did two notable pitches, one in front of, I don't know, I think it's over 500 people. Like my, like in the moment, I was like, there's a thousand people in this crowd. Right. Cause it was a deep room. It was a giant conference room. Uh, and the other one was like 60 people. But in each one, I think I crushed it. And it was just cause I ran through that process that he taught. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, Pitches. We'll, we'll anchor to that. And we're going to go back through that as we talk through the process of learning and everything in this mm-hmm. episode. But before I get into that, I want to talk about the benefits of learning. So first of all, let's define what learning actually means. So to me, learning is uh, ingesting new information to learn a new skill, behavior, pattern of mindset uh, that is going to add some type of benefit to your toolbox. Uh, You can also learn negative things, I guess, but this is about trying to be intentional about learning new topics of information that are gonna benefit you. So some of the benefits of learning new things, one, learning information changes and grows your perspective. So one of the things that I like to say a lot is when I'm making a decision, I know that my perspective is this big. I think of like a porthole in a submarine or on a boat or something, right? Like based on all of my biases, my experiences, my knowledge base, it's this big. Every time I add a node of information or a person to help with the decision, it expands the size of the porthole. So my perspective becomes that much bigger while I'm reviewing it. And so learning expands your perspective or changes it altogether. It's like you're looking out a different window, right? Like, 
uh, to make, pick a really easy one. Maybe you're a Democrat. You have a conversation with somebody who is very, very knowledgeable about pol political science and issues that you care a lot about, and you flip to become Republican. Your perspective has changed from that conversation. Number two, it prevents groupthink and echo chambers, learning new information. We're going to talk about this later in the episode when we talk about uh, curating your diet for information that you're ingesting. It's really easy to read headlines, follow people, influencers who are in alignment with your current belief system, and you may not actually be learning anything new. You're just continuing to shout the same message louder and louder because you're reading more headlines in association with it. So the point of actually deeply learning fundamentally about something is you're not just regurgitating the stuff that's coming to you, it's a thoughtful exercise. Number three, learning improves performance in work and in life. So skills that you generate, whether it's a tangible skill like finance, uh, you know, managing a pro forma, or it is a self-improvement skill like becoming more mindful or patient or something like that, a softer skill, those things are going to benefit you across different facets of your life. Being good at putting a pro forma together, you can put together a personal budget, you can do a work project budget, and being more patient is gonna make you a better leader, coworker, father, daughter, whatever. Um, and then finally, it keeps things fresh. Uh, so to continue learning, it, it incites new thought patterns and new types of people that are gonna be introduced into your life as you learn new topics. And so therefore, it adds a little bit of the spice of life if you continue to um, look for new ways to grow, learn, and improve. Mm. So um, do you have any other benefits you wanna stack on there? For learning in general? Yeah. I mean, that you nailed a ton of them there. Cool. I mean, for, no, I don't think so. I mean, I know that from like a neuroscientific perspective, learning something new adds novelty to your life and in turn like creates a bunch of neural connections that your brain really enjoys. So learning in general is just good for your overall, like overall well-being. Yep. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, um, there we're going to get into a concept called the four, uh, stages of competence, the four stages of competence. Yep. Um, before we get into that, there is actually a trigger event for learning something. So what I want to transition into now, we just talked about the benefits of learning. I want to get into the how to of learning. So first and foremost, remember the concept of teachable moments mm -hmm. where we talked about that teachable moments are, it's this idea that people are not ready to make a change in their life or to learn a new topic until they decide that they are ready to learn a new topic. Mm -hmm. So for example, a teacher is not going to be able to get a kid to understand this math problem if the kid in their head believes that they either can't do it or they uh, just don't want to learn the material right? The kid has to be excited and enthused and see the benefit in learning this math problem or the solution to the math problem to thereby be interested. So teachable moments, we talked about it a lot in the context of you are trying to teach somebody else something. But I think teachable moments also exist in the capacity of you wanting to learn something for yourself. Like you trigger your own teachable moment where you are going to go down a rabbit hole of learning new information. So the example that I'll use here that I have prepared, and I want to go back to your business pitch. Do you know why a subway station, like a, a subway in New York, do you know why they have conductors? No. No, mm -hmm. me neither. But what if you lived in New York, you were looking for jobs, and you saw a subway conductor listed as a job in the classifieds. I have to imagine you go fucking figure out why the subway has a conductor at that point, right? Otherwise, you can't really apply for the job. So there's your teachable moment. There is the catalyst to go learn something. That is a random piece of information, like knowing that the thing on the bottom of your shoelace is called an aglet, just another. So you're saying it was important to that person, that particular person in that moment, this is important. 
So I need to go learn it. It became a trigger. But the identify the first trigger is this is important. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So step one in learning something is identifying the catalyst or, or recognizing the trigger, however you mm. want to frame that. But there is going to be something. Let's, let's go back to your business pitch. You had never done that before because in the past you had done restaurants mm -hmm. to get funding for a restaurant. Sure. You had to do a presentation, but a restaurant is sort of a restaurant as a restaurant, all these tech executives and VCs and whomever else doesn't need to see a whole kit and caboodle. As far as the presentation goes, this is your first software company. You were interested in raising money. You were part of a networking group. You, you know, all of these things had to align for you to give this presentation to take on grant money or raise funding. And so therefore you had this catalyst of, I started this company, I need to raise funding, I have to do a pitch. That triggered a series of learning opportunities for you to end up on stage in front of 500 people giving that presentation. But when you're in college studying finance, there's no reason for you to put together a business pitch, you never would have done that. There was no trigger for that thread. Mm -mm. Right. There was nothing that really that important other than getting a good grade. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so how can somebody in your opinion self ascribe a teachable moment for themselves? Because it seems reactive <clears throat> to only learn when you have a trigger event. Mm. So how can somebody sort of like be proactive in finding opportunities to learn? Yeah. So the first thing that popped in my head was when we talk about like those trigger events is what I call like a success clue. Right. Whenever there is an, whenever you find yourself in like an uncomfortable moment or maybe if you can identify that this thing here, per, like I get anxiety with this particular situation or, um, I'm uncomfortable over here, but you know that like that thing that's uncomfortable is somewhere you need to lean, mm. right? You just have that distance between should and do, right? You know, everyone has these things that they should do but they don't do them. Right. Right. I think that we all know them, right. We're not, we're not, we're not all stupid. Like we don't all think that like life is fairies and walking through daisies all day. Right. Like there's shit that needs to get done. And right. we all know that there's stuff we should be doing. Um, I think the teachable moments lie in the painful parts of should and not doing right. Huh? That distance between them. And then right there, if it's, strong enough and painful enough, if it's really something you're avoiding, then it'll provide you with enough, I guess, intrinsic motivation to actually do it. And that right there is a teachable moment. So for me, it's like identifying those, um, success clues. So I obviously, we talk about this in every freaking episode, but mindfulness and meditating is really important to you. Yeah. What what ways can somebody generate enough self-awareness to, to, to identify that, you know, yeah. without the easy answer of just spend more time thinking about it. Is there anything in particular that you could suggest? Yeah, I would say like I started thinking in this particular way and I know other people that have too. like, I even know business coaches that teach stuff like this, but like most of the time it's people that aren't, mindful or aren't doing some sort of mindfulness practice. So I don't think you necessarily need to have a mindfulness practice in order to identify like a, your own personal teachable moment. Mm. I think it's more along the lines of like, where are you the most unhappy? Right. Just look at your life, look at it in the span of things or whatever it is, like personal relationships, whatever it might be and identify the one part that you're really like struggling with. Nice. Right. And there's probably something on the other end of some facet of that. That's like this blockage or this thing that you should be doing and you're not doing. I had, a, I had a mentor one time, um, without like getting into the drawn out story of it, I was going through kind of like my own like teachable moments, right? There's a deep struggle once you actually get to like the deeper teachable moments. And in that struggle, um, it's just like a weird time. It always is right, right before a breakthrough. There's always like this breakdown. And he told me that like to go home, get in front of a whiteboard and write everything, write five, at least five things, top five things that I'm avoiding in my life. And then over the next month to start knocking down each one. Hmm. And it was exactly that, right? I was, I had this like moment. I needed someone to like share this one piece of advice, which was go make a list. 
And then from there, I had five things to worry about, like five teachable moments only that I can focus on over the next like month or two Very months or three cool. months. Mm -hmm. So that is perfect. How to be proactive in identifying, you know, catalysts that you can go grab onto to learn. Mm -hmm. Look for your weaknesses. What things are you avoiding? What are bad habits that you want to get rid of and, and go tackle those? Speaking of habits, last week's episode. Mm. Um, cool. So the second step, once you identify the catalyst is to decide to engage. Right. So as you just said, when you realize that you have a teachable moment, there's sort of this, oh shit. And there's a struggle incumbent in that. You just stole the next part of the, the thing here. So you recognize I have a deficit. Like there's a thing that I need to learn here. So you can fight, flee or freeze. Right. So fighting in the context of learning a new skill means I am going to dig in and commit to whatever the breadth of time is that I have to learn this thing. Fleeing is nah, fuck that. Like I'm, I'm just not doing it and freezes somewhere in between you sort of like step one step forward, two steps back. It's, it's like when your friend invites you to go skiing, you've never been skiing before and you're like, Oh, that sounds really cool. I would love to. And then you ghost their next five, 10 phone calls asking you to go skiing. That's the definition of freezing. Fleeing is not nah, fucked that. I'm not interested And in fighting is yeah, I'm going to get some lessons and we'll take care of this. So in order to actually enter the arena and to become somebody who is on the path to learning, you have to decide to engage with the material and go through the struggle. Um, and the next thing that we're going to talk about here is, the, the four stages to actually developing competence in a, uh, in a particular area. But one thing, so when I was leaving untapped, I called you and I told you like, Hey, I'm thinking about leaving. And you said, look, dude, at the end of the day, if this all goes to shit, at least you learn something really cool, right? You'll learn how to build a startup. You'll learn how to do all these little things that you don't even know what you're going to be able to do. That was, that was, powerful advice, right? Like when we are oriented for learning, that is something that we prioritize over other elements that um, may be really important to other people. Like you and I consider ourselves lifelong learners. So do you think, like, when do you think it's appropriate to bail on a learning opportunity? Like, is there ever a time to settle instead of pursuing the knowledge? Like there's a big risk or something, because we were talking about me leaving a huge career opportunity and really rolling the dice and you were still like, fuck it, go for it. So I'm curious mm. where you see that threshold. So I, that's a good question. I think that threshold is different for everybody. Cause you know, I'll just, for me, I know that one of like my patterns is I'm really bad at giving up. Like I'm really bad at stopping anything. Um, that could be like personal relationships or business. doesn't matter what it is. I just like, I just, the over optimistic guy that just like goes, but I, one thing I, I think has helped in combating that. Cause it's really what you're asking is like, what's the opposite of that? Like, how do you know when like, this is okay, I've learned enough here and it's time to maybe step to the next learning experience. Um, I've, there's like one question I've asked myself in the past and it's, is it worth it? So when you're going into something and you are stretched way outside your comfort zone, or if it's like really, um, if you really are insufficient or, um, have a huge deficit in the skill that is in front of you and it's, it's a real big gap, you gotta ask yourself, like, is it worth it? Like, for example, if you want to go start a company and it's in quantum computing or something like that, right? Like you have a, something you have to ask yourself, like is quantum computing, should I just go learn how to write code in quantum code? Like, is that a skill that I should acquire in order to start this company? And is it worth it? Probably not. No. You could probably find somebody that can partner with you and, and get that done. So I think that like, and that's a very extreme example, what? but scale that. But the point rings <laughs> true. The point, right. Like the, 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 the point is like, there is a self-awareness piece that says like, here's my innate skills. Here's like this path that is right for me. And there's obviously a bazillion things that you can learn along that path. And you have to be really specific as to which ones you want to learn. Mm. And then that's where it comes with building a tribe, building a team and then identifying like all the gaps and everything in there and doing it that way. But the question is, is it worth it? 
is the question I always come back to when, when it comes to like keeping going on a learning curve or when, when for you, I understand you're saying it's a personal question to ask that when for you, is it not worth it? So there's a, again, that's another very like personal, I think everyone's different, right? For me, I am really cognizant about like having a good crafted life, like a good blend of life. And if I can identify a skill that's literally going to take up like maybe family time or time with my wife or time with like maybe focusing on something else that I really care about. And if I, you know, if I can identify like, if I keep going down this path, it's going to take from somewhere where I don't want it to take from, then is it worth it becomes like, okay, no, it's not. So because I can replace it with somebody or I can do find someone else to, to do it. Got it. Mm-hmm. So you think about it in terms of like where it fits in bucket of time, based time, on the other money priorities and energy that you have. Yeah. Time, okay. money and energy. Right. Cause there's an ROI on these things that you need to expect. And if you're going to put time, money and energy, cause a lot of times it takes those three things to, do something to worth develop it. a skill. It better be worth it for all three of those. Right. Like, are you getting the ROI on all three? Is it worth it? Cool. Good answer. I like that. So getting into the four stages of learning, um, I took this. So, uh, the four stages of competence was started by a guy. The idea was coined by a guy named Martin Broadwell back in 1969. And the way he formats it is, uh, unconscious incompetence is the first stage. Second stage is conscious incompetence. Third stage is conscious competence and four stages, unconscious competence. I always butcher those. I <laughs> rebranded them. <laughs> Good. Um, so like I, the, the tenets of it remain the same, but like, yeah, I think that's overly simplified. And, um, he went a lot for like pattern of words. And I think that there are better like ways to describe each of the stages. Right. Like you don't know what you don't know. You, I yeah, understand right. that way Perfect. better than unconscious. Exactly. Yeah. So I call the first stage blissful ignorance. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the first stage of learning is the stage where you are way too fucking cocky because you're like, Oh, running a restaurant. I have been the VP of sales for a company that did X, Y, and Z. I can fucking do that. Like if I could do this, I can do that. And then you parlay into it and you're like, oh wow, this is actually way more complicated than I thought. So somebody in the stage of blissful ignorance, you can tell that somebody is there. If you have any nugget of experience or knowledge in a particular field and you hear somebody who you know has spent very minimal time there saying that's a breeze or I can do that or if it's really not that fucking challenging or complicated, that person is blissfully ignorant and you should not follow them on their path in that direction. (laughs) (laughs) So um, the way that it's described by Broadwell, he says the individual does not understand or know how to do something and does not necessarily recognize the deficit. They may deny the usefulness of this skill. The individual must recognize their own incompetence and the value of the new skill before moving on to the next stage. The length of time an individual spends in this stage depends on the strength of the stimulus to learn. Going back to what I said, that's the catalyst. How strong is the catalyst? How big of a driver is that teachable moment for that person is going to dictate at what threshold they move from this blissful ignorance recognize the struggle ahead of them as you and I characterized it, decide to engage and then proceed on to the step, the second step of the journey. So anyway, for you being the learner per people, listeners, acknowledge that you don't know shit before you like really try to take it on because it's incredibly humbling to get through this stage. (laughs) So let's use the pitch example, Mm -hmm. right? The pitch example is you, um, decide you recognize that you need to do a pitch. You think to yourself, I've done lots of sales calls. I've negotiated before I've read pitch decks. I'm an investor in a couple different companies. No problem. And then you sit down at your computer and you're like, okay, 
problem solution, right? What are frameworks for this? And then you realize very, then you start sweating. And next thing you know, you find yourself with like 47 tabs open, all of them on different Google (laughs) options of how to write a pitch deck. Um, So the example that I like to use when talking about this is pretend that you get invited to go hike on the Appalachian Trail your friend says, Hey, do you want to do this with me? And you're like, fuck yeah, that sounds awesome. I've been camping a couple of times and you commit, right? There you go. You're blissfully ignorant. You're now in a position where we transition into stage two, which as Broadwell calls it conscious incompetence. I call it painful awareness. So in this stage, you have started doing the research. Your friend just asked you to go hike the app trail. You said, fuck yeah. That that takes like a month, right? Then you Google it and it takes five to seven months according to Google. Thank you, Eric, for that real time uh, correction. One of my favorite things that people who are professionals in particular who have worked at Untapped in the past, I hear so often, oh yeah, I'm going to get into marketing. And they just use it as like this broad stroke term of marketing and think that it's like this easy thing that you just say the word marketing and you put some cool content up and whoop-ham, there you go. You are killing it in the marketing game. Not so easy, right? Um, So anyway, stage two, painful awareness. This is where you realize that you don't know shit and you have a massive road to transcend. This is what Eric referred to as the struggle. And this is where you need to decide to engage. As soon as you realize how little you know, You either sink your teeth in and say, I'm fucking going for it. You bail out and say, nah, never mind on the app trail. Or you pretend that you're going to the app trail and then you never go, i.e. freezing and just not correcting your friend. The third stage, uh, Broadwell calls conscious competence. I call it amateur expertise. So this is where you are starting to develop the skills to accomplish said task. You've earned it. You have some you have some scar tissue. You've gone through some lumps. So let's say, for example, the app trail example, um, you have tried out different gear. You've tried out different boots. You've gone overnight hiking a couple of times for just in and outs, you know, out and backs. Uh, you have done some stuff to prepare you to get there, but it takes a lot of conscious thinking. It's not muscle memory yet. You don't know how to set your tent up without another person helping you. And uh, you have to do a shit ton of Googling still to figure out how much food you need or um, where you can set up campsites. So at this point, you're getting some momentum, some wind in your sails. It feels good, but you're still an amateur uh, and you haven't figured it out. And then stage four, the final stage of competence, as according to Martin Brawell, unconscious competence, or as I call it, autodidact. Autodidact means a self-taught person. So you have earned it. At this point, everything is unconscious. It is muscle memory. Somebody else is asking you how to go hike the app trail now because you've been there, done that, and you could go do it again without too much like thought into how it actually happens. Not that it gets easier to hike for six months. but um, So yeah, the, the, the point of the four stages of competence are to recognize where you are on the threshold of learning, or excuse me, on the the quadrant of learning, and meeting yourself where you're at, not having an ego, and then growing from there. Um, So, Eric, I know we did this for a couple of these. I want you to go back through your, your pitch. What you talked about was the skill that you developed. Go back and work through those four steps and talk a little bit about how you process through them and saw yourself in all four of those stages. It was like this inevitable thing that I know needed to be done at some point. Like when you start a company, you make a choice whether to bootstrap, raise money, do whatever you need to do, right? That decision alone is is kind of like really, really hard decision to make. And when you decide to like try and raise money, like there's eventually going to be some sort of pitch. Not necessarily in front of a ton of people, Right, they're done virtually now and all that. They, they're a lot easier. But there was like a, I, I had a feeling that at some point that is that was going to be a skill. But I kind of just like I kind of avoided it. Like okay, like let's do these mini ones. Let me get five people in a room or whatever it is that I needed to do. Um, take like an accelerator program online or whatever it was. And then the thing that happened for me 
was I, I was invited to, to do it, to do one of the pitches. And it was for like a, the first, one of the first ones was like this big mentorship program. But that invitation was like this like serendipitous kind of Eric, wake up and you know, this has to be done. Right. Cause so there was an avoidance pattern and I knew that I recognized the avoidance pattern, but it wasn't like the button wasn't being pressed yet for urgency on mm-hmm. it. And then as soon as that invite came, like the personal invite from someone that, um, I, I, like I considered a mentor, um, the button was pressed and it was like, go time. Like, okay, this is, this is not going to be an avoidable thing anymore. This is going to have to be a skill I acquire. So it was probably, uh, it wasn't like that. The skill itself was unconscious and incompetent. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was like before I started thinking about starting a different company or whatever it was. But in this case, it was just an avoidance pattern. And then a commitment passed the avoidance pattern where then the struggle came in and like the learning experience was necessary and I created it to be necessary, right? You have to have that inner dialogue of this is just something that needs to be done. Exactly. And then, um, and there was enough motivators, there was intrinsic motivation, ex- external motivation, like all these things aligned where it was just like, this shit needs to be done. So I said, okay, to the invite, even though I've never done it before, it's only been like this passing thought. And I was like, all right, let's do it. I'll figure it out. Um, which is like the theme, right? I'll figure it out of a learner. Like I'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure this to out. To a detriment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No matter what. Yeah. So then from there it was, um, reading a couple books, uh, taking an online, uh, public speaking class, doing some, uh, what's that big public speaking group? Uh, uh, Toastmasters. Toastmasters, doing some Toastmasters. So there was a lot of education. So that's the struggle. So all this education, um, one of them was on the, one of the public speaking courses was on how to put places, like put the topics in places in your brain. So like you build a house in your head and it's usually like typically your house. Have you heard this before? Mm mm. So it's typically your house or your school or whatever it might be. Maybe it's your college campus and you, and you build the, and you build it in the sense that like you're going from one place to another. So if, let's say a college campus, for example, you're going to go from in your mind, from your dorm to a classroom that you go to all the time. Now, along the way, there are typical milestones that, you know, maybe there's a bridge here, a door here, a closet over here, and you put the topics in like, and place them in some crazy way next to these milestones and then as you're speaking you literally just take that journey Interesting. but it has to be something that completely like triggers the memory like you have to connect with like not only not only do you have to connect with the thing inside your head but it has to be emotional and the best way to do that is to make it ridiculous and funny uh and then you that's the best way to remember it so that way when you're actually delivering it you don't have to rely on your memory. It's all just connected to like places that are specifically done. Right. So you literally list out the places and you write down, you journal on whatever you need to do to remember it. And then you attach whatever it is to it. So then the actual execution part, you know, this is, might be a little bit different because the execution is so big. Like it's so big and bold. Like it's not like writing a book where you have to struggle through the ideas of writing and like get, get there. Like, once you're ready to deliver the book, you did the struggle. Sure. Right. But this one, the struggle is in the delivery. So it's a little bit, I think of a different process and maybe the outcome is raising money. Sure. And so like, that's the, that's the end threshold and you have to do a pitch incumbent in that. Right. 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 The pitch itself isn't the actual yeah. like end result, but so then the pitch itself then is also yeah part of the struggle, right? Totally part of the struggle. Um, And so that stage was more along the lines of internal dialogue. I got this. I can do this. I've already like done the struggle. And once you've done the struggle, it's, it's hard not to feel prepared. And that's kind of like one of the success clues. Like if you go into doing something and you still feel like a massive amount of anxiety or whatever it is, you probably didn't prepare enough. Mm. So it's almost like when you go to practice it, if you're still feeling all those things, then you probably just got to do some more research. You probably got to practice more. And then that's all part of like the struggle too. And then the delivery itself becomes a little bit more flowy because you've got this thing committed to your brain. You've, you've done like all the struggle research. You've, you've, you've asked yourself like, is there anything else I can do to make myself better at this? And then from there, it's almost like a surrender to biology, right? Because if you're going to be nervous at it, you're going to be nervous at it. 
Um, and then, and then the delivery is just go time, right? It's set a date, which is guaranteed in something like a pitch. So date set, no turning back. I'm in, you step into the light. Hopefully it goes well. <laughs> step into the light. I like that. Yeah. Hopefully it goes well. And if it doesn't, well, I guess you learned something new. Yeah. Yeah. You learned. Yeah. That was the whole point. <laughs> that was right? the whole point. You may not have raised the money, but you learned. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. So that's the four stages of competence uh, or four stages of learning, however you want to look at that. The last bit on how to actually learn is the concept of learning fast and deep. And so it's not just getting the information for information's sake. It's a matter of deepening your uh, knowledge base of the info and expediting the amount of time that it takes to learn the skill or the bit of information. And so there are two things or three, three things rather that I think are really important in this. Number one is seeking out mentors. Mm. So if you want to hike the app trail, if you want to pitch, you know, you need to find somebody who has hiked the app trail, who can train you and accelerate your learning on all the gear, the food, they just know this stuff wrote, right? They're autodidacts somebody who has pitched before, raised millions of dollars for different companies and has been in the space that you've been in, the quicker you can identify those people, they will help you learn faster. Guaranteed that they have bundled and shared all their knowledge somewhere in some way in a YouTube video or anything like that. Like there is so, there's enough information to learn just about anything out there. Yep. Yeah. Um, I still think there is a benefit in having a mentor dedicated Absolutely. to your success mm-hmm. um, in addition to the places where you can get all that information on YouTube articles, whatever. Um, so that's to learn fast mentorship. To learn deep, it's testing. Test everything. So if going back to the app trail, it's testing out a few pairs of boots. It's going to cost you an extra maybe 200 bucks or something like that, but If you're going to spend six months in the same pair of shoes, it's worth it to test three pairs. Then once you learn which pair works for you, you're able to say, oh yeah, those two don't work because of this reason and this reason. That is deepening your knowledge base uh, as far as the app trail goes. When you're pitching, testing different audiences, different openings, it's A, B, A, B, A, B. So testing deepens your knowledge. And then finally to just check yourself and make sure that you're going quick and, uh, and, and, um, learning everything you need to being honest with yourself, like where am I on the curve, not having an ego about it, because if you get defensive or stubborn or, uh, out of touch with reality, it's going to slow you way down and it's going to resist your ability to like go all the way in on whatever the topic is that you're trying to learn. So, My last question for you before we get into uh, diet consumption, or excuse me, information consumption, pretend you are learning, uh, pretend you want to run a marathon. Okay. So you can either have a coach who is telling you exactly what you're supposed to do, but if something doesn't fit your lifestyle, like say they say you have to get up every day at 6 a.m. to go train, and you, you have to miss that two days a week, there's zero flexibility. On the other hand, you can have full flexibility. You can do whatever the fuck you want to prep and train, but you do not get any one-on-one coaching. Right. So the second one is where if I wanted to, I can run a half marathon four times in order to prepare myself for a full marathon. Right. Right. It doesn't matter when there's no time, like time constraints. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so the question is to pick one or the other. Yes. The other variables is there a time constraint on when I need to get the marathon done? Yeah. Let's say the marathon is December 15th. So So I have three and a half months, three and a half months. Yeah. Um, and like, it's a guaranteed 100% I'm running this marathon. There's no backing out. There's no nothing. Right. That's the whole point. Yeah. Coach all day. Coach all day. Yeah. All right, cool. I think I would, I would choose the same. Uh, for a marathon Mm -hmm. because it's a big lift. Yeah. You told me about that, that dude that lived with David Goggins for, yeah, Jesse Itzler. Jesse Itzler. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that shit's that I think about that awesome. sometimes. Living like, with dude, a seal. Yeah. Um, I think about that a lot, too. It'd be an intense month or whatever, mm-hmm. how long he did it. But it'd be a lot of fun and painful. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
the last thing I want to talk about as it relates to uh, learning is how to have a good diet of uh, information coming to you. So five quick heavy hitter things. Um, number one is limiting your amount of vanity consumption. So I don't think that social media is inherently bad. I think that the way that people curate their feeds though is a lot of bullshit and stuff that's actually not gonna give them much insight. In addition to the social media, that means not just reading a headline and passing it along and assuming that everything within the article is gospel. So taking the time to understand the journalists, the motivations underneath it, the policies that are being referenced or uh, data underlying the thing and not just clicking onto a clickbaity article for the sake of assuming that the headline is gonna be true because they're often misleading. Number two is read or consume audiobooks. Mm. Like take the time to do the deep dives. There are a lot of people who have interviewed uh, for different jobs who say, I like to read articles. I think that's awesome. I think listening to podcasts is awesome, but books are written in a way that you can do an absolute deep dive into a particular subject. I think there should be a blend of fiction and nonfiction to get some of your creative juices flowing to complement some of the new skills you're learning. But taking the time to actually work your way through a book or an audio book is a great way to understand the fundamentals underneath something. You know, it, people, anyone can write an article. Like I've written articles, right? And I've, I, I can't imagine, and just doing some of like putting the programs together and stuff like that, I have gotten this like glimpse into what it might take to write a book and the amount of energy and time and research and thought and like pure passion that goes into writing a proper book, um, you can't deny the fact that that person has thought through it enough where their words are worth absorbing in some way. Or like I could throw an article out tomorrow. I think there are definitely bullshit books that exist out there. Totally. But, um, I think the ratio of valuable information in a book versus an article is probably higher. Right. The commitment to write a book is definitely, there's a journey there of its own self that I, I think, yeah. I agree. Uh, next is email newsletters. <clears throat> These are bite-sized curated bits of information that are going to supplement your knowledge base in one way or the other. So think Morning Brew, all about finance, business, uh, anything related to that field. Amazingly written, lots of research underlies it. The Hustle, all about startups, all about uh, also a business newsletter. Um, you have David Perel, who is, he has a company called uh, davidperel.com. He has a course called Rite of Passage. His stuff is amazing. It's about art and stuff that he learned throughout the week. You have Ben Thompson, who writes Stratechery. It's a paid email newsletter. Mark Manson, who wrote Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. The list goes on and on. But some of these people who are really credible authors or thought leaders have newsletters you can subscribe to. So one or two days a week, you just suck it up and get the information straight yeah. to your noggin. James Clear's got a good one. Uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Jamie Wheel, Stephen Kotler. There's oh, yeah, so many days. out yeah. there. And then uh, online courses. So uh, something related to a skill or a pattern of habits that you want to take on. Obviously, Beanie Blazers launching Mindset Accelerator, but there are lots of other tools like Coursera, uh, Mind Valley, uh, Masterclass, some of these other ones who put content out there for you to consume. They're typically actionable, come with exercises, and you get a lot out of it. So be intentional about the diet that you're consuming uh, is the point there. Now, finally, key takeaways from the episode. Number one, you have the capacity to learn. It's a matter of effort and curation. So put in the time, put in the energy, decide to engage, and curate the stuff that you're ingesting so it's not a bunch of bullshit. Assume that you're stupid on a topic and aspire to unstupidify yourself. <laughs> so just assume you're dumb, don't have an ego about it, and just have the ambition of becoming less dumb about the thing that you're learning. I love that. Um, ask for help. Uh, mm -hmm. It sort of goes with unstupidifying yourself, but don't be afraid to ask people who have been there, done that, who are credible, believable people for help, going back to Ray Dalio, and embrace failure, embrace failure learn to love the process. Uh, learning for learning's sake is better than ultimately raising that bit of money for your business that could be argued i guess but like optimizing for the learning experience whether or not you succeed or fail it's all about the growth mindset and just enjoying 
the struggle that goes along with it. Yeah. And not to rip off like memes and stuff like that, but fall in love with the journey is so like true. So true. It really is. And if you don't like, and there's going to be times where you hate the fucking journey, right? It's guaranteed. That's part of the struggle. Yep. But the idea is to just keep remembering that, um, it's, uh, it's for life. And if you know it's for life, then, um, it, you can't get mad at it. You can't, you have to develop the gratitude for it. For the knowledge that you're developing. The mindset of being like a learner. Got it. Is for life. Got right? it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, and, and if you, yeah, just get good at it. At learning. But, yeah. I think we're all, I mean, you and I, everyone I know, even some of like the dudes that I aspire to be more like, like I guarantee you, they are still trying to figure out learning. It, right. Yep. Never ends. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. The weekly challenge is our favorite part of the show because we get to torture each other uh, for the sake of learning, of course. Behind us, we have a chalkboard. On this chalkboard, we're keeping score. Every episode, one of us has to complete a challenge that the other one has assigned to the other. At the end of 10 episodes, we're going to do a listener-submitted challenge and a reward submitted by a listener for the person who has earned the most points. So far, we are... Uh, basically tied. You're just one episode ahead of me. Nobody has failed a challenge yet. Um, so we'll see. Uh, anyway, getting to it. So my challenge this past week, last week's challenge, last yeah. week's challenge was to do an opposite day. And just full disclosure, I was ill prepared in developing the challenge before the challenge was actually given. I came up with it right then and there. So you got lucky with the, I guess the rate of difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, so the idea was my routine, basically flip it upside down. Now, one thing that's sort of a joke on you is my routine has been not very consistent for the last 10 days. So I had started reorganizing it, flipped it on its head. Some of the things that I changed, I woke up and typically I work out first thing in the morning. So seven to eight is sort of like workout time. Didn't do that, and typically before bed, I do like my gratefuls, my power down, um, you know, planning the schedule for the next day and everything. So I spent the seven to 8 a.m., did gratitudes, meditation, and basically planned out my day. Like typically I do it the night before, but I intentionally did it that morning for the rest of the day, if that makes sense. Mm. For breakfast, I had chicken and Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Uh, for dinner, I had eggs and sausage, which is typically in a protein shake, which is typically my breakfast, very protein heavy for breakfast, um, or dinner. Then in this case, it's a lot of sugar before bed and protein shake, chicken was and like Brussels sprouts before bed. No protein shake. Oh, at right. Night. Yeah. No, it was exactly. a couple hours before I went to bed. Mm. So I had settled down. The protein shakes aren't too sugary. Um, anyway, then, uh, Let's see what else happened. Oh, I spent from nine to 11. I had a bunch of shit that I needed to like sell and buy on Facebook marketplace. Like I needed a weed whacker. I needed to sell a couple of chairs. So I went and listed a bunch of shit. Typically I would do that at nighttime. And then basically thereafter I just worked on beanie and blazer until like I was done. And then I spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes before bed, just like chilling, not really doing anything. <clears throat> so it was sort of like, I don't have enough things in my day happening right now. It's basically mm -hmm. working on the business or working out or something that. Right. Since you up. left, since you left like your last business, your entire life just kind of got thrown in the shambles as far as routines go. It, yes. Imagine. And a lot of it's just self like yeah. discipline and making sure that I'm sticking to my stuff. Well, the, so there is a point behind the, that, that challenge that I think is important to point out <clears throat> One, if you can identify 15 or 20 habits that you're already in in your life or routines that you already have, whether they're good or bad, doesn't really matter what they are, then it's that much easier to stack good habits that you're trying to build on top of them. Right. So taking a day and completely reversing it helps you like hyper aware of your typical routine so that later on you can start developing a habit, stack it on, on top of something that you've already like, That makes a done. lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I appreciate it. I, I sort of wish like... Again, you've acknowledged that that was off the cuff. I wish that we had done that in like 
a couple of months. Like once I was more settled in as CEO and like have all this stuff firing on all cylinders, I would like to try that again at some point. Um, and maybe like as the challenges get harder, it's just a longer period of time. Um, but anyway, it was interesting, but not sexy. I don't have anything cool to report back on Brussels sprouts for breakfast are about as good as they sound. Mm -hmm. It was like not ideal before 9am, but tis what tis we're learning. So, uh, yeah, give me, chalk me. Chalk me, you bitch. Sure, yeah. Do I have to put it up? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think this is going to be it. So now your turn for a challenge. I think that this is going to be the hardest one yet. I just went through this myself. I did this challenge to see how hard it was before I gave it to you. It's fucking That's hard, admirable. but it's doable. I do, you're not allowed to drink coffee for 72 hours or caffeine period. No caffeine ingestion for three days. For me, I was consuming like typically a cup of coffee or a red eye in the morning. So a shot of espresso and a cup of coffee. Then after lunch, like one, two o'clock, I would pop a caffeine pill, 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is like another cup of coffee or an espresso shot or something. It's like, like two cups of coffee. It's a strong cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah. But so it was typically like, if, if we were just looking at a plain black cup of coffee, I probably average three and a half a day, roughly. I concentrate it. But then I went cold fucking turkey, dude. Day one, no problem. I felt pretty sprightly. Day two, I crashed, like anxious, feeling depressed, not able to focus on work. It took me like three hours to write headers for ads that I can usually just bang that stuff out. Um, that lasted for two days. Then this morning, I was gonna go a full week was what I wanted to do. Then this morning, I could not focus again. We have a launch coming on Monday with content that's going live. I, I ended up taking a caffeine pill, so I bailed on it today. Three so days, you did, you did zero two days? caffeine. I did three. So you actually successfully did the three. Yeah, yeah, it sucked. Mm -hmm. I've done it. Um, I've 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 done this a few times in my life already. Okay, it sucks. It sucks. And I don't want to do that. Yeah, I drink. I don't drink a lot of coffee. You, okay, you, you take more caffeine than I do for sure. Yeah, I probably have like a cup and a half a day in the morning. And okay, that's about it. All right. Um, then maybe it won't be that bad. But yeah, I guess so. Today's Friday. We're recording on Tuesday. It has to be Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, we you, have. You like in my mind. I've been like no joke. I've been thinking about like doing like cutting out coffee. I just haven't had the intrinsic motivation enough to do it because I've just I'm busy. Yeah. And it feels good to get that like it does. jolt. Dude, right? it's I just felt like, like Bradley Cooper and Limitless today. I took that caffeine pill. I was like, ah, I'm back, motherfuckers. Okay. So just no caffeine. No caffeine. No yeah. caffeine. But yeah. like, there's like other things you can do. You can use nootropics. Not... Yeah. Like, have okay. a shamanistic journey, whatever. Shaman, <laughs> shamanic journey. Uh, cool. Yeah. So 72 right. hours, no caffeine. Fuck. Yeah, the last time I did this, like on my third day, I was like really sad. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, really, was, like, I, I was sad. Like I called my mom. I was like, what I do I have wanna, on? So I, Monday I'm going to be sad. I just want to talk. You want to do lunch on Monday? Sure, man. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> you I'll, can maybe uh, pick I'll me up. I'll throw it in the calendar. <laughs> 12 o'clock. Cuddle, Eric. Cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's in. Our last segment is entrepreneurs on the fly. Here we talk about things that are going on in our actual businesses, problems that we're facing, lessons that we've learned, and recommendations to improve. Uh, I have a couple things I wanted to talk about. Do you have anything that you wanted to cover? Well, I have one thing. Okay, cool. You go. And first. I figured it's perfect. I, so, you know, when you run your own show, you don't, you can't gripe up. You know, gripes go up. So I'm going to gripe to you. Okay. I missed. Two of my own deadlines I sent for my I, I set for myself okay. already in the last two weeks. Go on. That's it. How and why? I, a million things. Uh, nanny call out 
and I had to like be on baby duty, just chiseled out a ton of time that I had like dedicated in my calendar to spend on this one thing that I was like on my deadline. Okay. And we're talking like, this is a four hour gap where I was like, okay, this is going to be two flow sessions. If you want to use that term, um, of like work to get done. And I just couldn't do it. So the only other way to do it would be to like move it to evenings, which I did one day. Um, and the second day I was just like too tired. I'm in bed by like eight 30. Mm-hmm. So I don't really have an evening, but, um, I did it one day and I was just, I missed my today's deadline on getting something done, which was actually supposed to be done by Tuesday. And I moved it into today and I still didn't do it. I appreciate your transparency. I think this is a really big thing, um, that I, most most people don't like talking about that. Like everybody wants everybody to think that they're fucking machines. Like two days ago, and granted I was going through my caffeine withdrawal and I have like, I am giving myself some grace here. One o'clock in the afternoon, middle of a flow session. I'm supposed to be cranking out copy cause we're launching uh, our essays go live on Monday. So I have, I have a shit ton of work to do. I fucking read Goblet of Fire for an hour and a half in the middle of the day because I didn't want to fucking do it and I couldn't do it and I wouldn't do it and I I did Mm. and uh, I don't feel great about that but I think you know it's like that whole motivation uh inspiration is bullshit like there I have been giving myself a hard time because I'm so fucking excited about this business that I am building. It's a, it's amazing. It can transform people's lives. People get excited about it. When I talk about it, we're sitting here doing this. This is awesome. But then the reality of sometimes like, shit, I don't know what action I should be taking right now and needing to break down the challenge skills balance, or I'm scared of putting this video out and being judged for it. Like those little things creep up and sort of pull me back. Um, so it's definitely been an active thought exercise for me over the last few weeks of battling through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, that's the thing, right? Like identifying those, those avoidance patterns, like moving a deadline. The truth is, if I really wanted to get it done, I could have got up at 3 a.m., right? I could have taken a nap instead of a sleep, but like I, I prioritized my sleep. I could have like skipped a dinner, right? If I really wanted to get it done, I could have got it done. For sure. Like one of the things, um, one of the tactics that I've used in the past, but like not to the extent that I probably should, that I was taught by a business coach was to pick, uh, let's just say like a, maybe it's political or or some uh, uh, charity that you really just don't agree with, some cause that you really just don't agree with, and a, a dollar sum amount that you really can't part with and commit to sending like, put a check in the mail, put it like in there for them, write it to them, have it ready, have a partner, like someone that's doing it with you, give it to them and say, look, if I don't get this done by this date, mail this check out to, you know, I don't know, Joe Biden or whatever it might be. And that will get it done. If it's that painful for you to like support something you really, you really care about the opposite opposing view Hmm. or something like that. That's really interesting. Um, it takes another person to do it though. So I was going to talk about the benefit for me of having a team. So it's like when I have Jake or Will or Hannah who are pressing on, like we have collectively set these deadlines. We have said we're going to get there and I have other people who are watching that. And if I miss it, it's on me. That is a really good incentive for me to drive. So I haven't missed a deadline. I knew I was reading an hour and a half of Harry Potter when I should have been working. But now it's like, okay, well, now I just don't have a Saturday because I'm going to go through and bang it out. I'm going to hit that fucking deadline. Right, well, missing that deadline is a threat to your identity. That's the biggest one that you can, if you can find a threat to your identity, then I think that you'll hit your deadline. For you, you identify as an entrepreneur, a leader. Yeah, right. right. Missing that deadline literally threatens who you are, your identity. But I'm also comfortable like dicking off for an hour and reading (laughs) Harry Potter. So um, very. that was a good one. Yeah, nice and vulnerable. Uh, So... I guess to the listeners, like if, if you struggle with, um, you know, questions of self doubt or ideas of ways that you can stay motivated through some of those downtimes when there's a lot of stuff pulling at your attention or you just don't feel like fucking doing the work, let us know. The low energy, yeah. like it's guaranteed to have low energy days. 
podcast at beanieandblazer.com. We would love to hear your stories, share with you ours, um, and just misery loves company, right? So yeah. as we're building this, uh, try to find some friends in the whole thing. So awesome. Good shit. Good stuff. Cool. Thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, really, man. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank I'm grateful you. for you. Thank you. I'm excited for dinner tonight. Oh, me too. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to Beanie and Blazer Radio. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave a review on your favorite listening platform. It makes a huge difference and we really appreciate it. For more resources, visit our website, beanieandblazer.com. We have tons of other great content available for you to check out. Stay tuned for new episodes of the podcast every Thursday. Thanks again for listening.